Hey everyone, this lesson is on vitamin K deficiency. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the sources of vitamin K. We're also gonna talk about the purposes as to why we need vitamin K. And we're also gonna talk about the causes of vitamin K deficiency along with the signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it and how we can treat vitamin K deficiency. So to begin, what is vitamin K? Vitamin K is actually a group of fat soluble compounds. So there are actually multiple compounds that we actually call vitamin K. One of them is vitamin K1, which is phyloquinone, and another one is vitamin K2, which is menaquinone. And vitamin K is actually one of the fat-soluble vitamins. The other ones are vitamin D, E, and A. Now, vitamin K is important because it's required for several processes. And it's required for several processes by way of vitamin K-dependent proteins. One of those processes is actually production and modification of coagulation factors. And another process that's important with regards to vitamin K is bone development. We're going to talk about these two processes in the next upcoming slides. So what are the sources of vitamin K? Where do we actually get vitamin K? So by far the most is going to come from our diet. So dietary sources of vitamin K come from leafy greens and vegetables. And these include Brussels sprouts, and spinach and kale. And these sources actually have a very high amount of vitamin K. And it's actually a specific type of vitamin K, vitamin K1 or phyloquinone. We can also find vitamin K in fermented foods. And we see that it is actually vitamin K2 that is found in fermented foods. And we can also get vitamin K from other sources as well. So endogenously, we can actually get it from certain intestinal flora. So certain intestinal flora can produce vitamin K2. So these are the main sources of vitamin K. And we can also get vitamin K in other foods like some fruits, but usually vitamin K is only at a very low level in these sources. So the recommended daily intake of vitamin K differs between men and women. So with women, it's recommended that a woman has 90 micrograms of vitamin K per day. That's the recommended or the adequate daily intake. Whereas for men, it's 120 micrograms per day. So these are the recommended values. So how is vitamin K absorbed? So once we ingest vitamin K1, it enters into our gastrointestinal tract. And because it's a fat soluble vitamin, we need bile and bile helps to emulsify fats. We also need some pancreatic enzymes to help digest certain fats as well. And ultimately, the digested and processed vitamin K1 leads to the jejunum and ileum, and usually the terminal ileum, are the sources where we actually absorb the fat-soluble vitamins. So we can absorb vitamin K1 in the jejunum and the ileum. And then once it's absorbed from the jejunum and the ileum, it enters into the bloodstream. And it can actually bind to chylomicron. And chylomicron actually tr helps transport vitamin K1 throughout the body. So why do we need vitamin K? So we talked about some of the processes that require vitamin K. So we'll talk about those processes in more detail here. So vitamin K acts as a cofactor for enzymes like gamma glutamyl carboxylase and vitamin K2-3 epoxide reductase. These enzymes actually add a gamma carboxyglutamic acid two clotting factors or coagulation factors, two, seven, nine, and 10. And this occurs in the liver. So the reason why we need vitamin K ultimately is again because it acts as a cofactor with these enzymes to add a gamma carboxyglutamic acid to the coagulation factors, two, seven, nine, and 10. And adding that gamma carboxyglutamic acid to these factors allows those factors to bind to platelets better. So if we don't have gamma carboxyglutamic acid added properly to the coagulation factors, the coagulation factors don't work properly. And we also see that vitamin K1 carboxylates osteocalcin, and osteocalcin is involved in bone mineralization. So what has been found is that when vitamin K levels are low, osteocalcin is carboxylated less, which means that there is less bone mineralization. There's actually a lower bone mineral density. So those are the simplified mechanisms as to why we need vitamin K. So what are some of the causes of vitamin K deficiency? So one of them is actually the neonatal period. So in the neonatal period, newborns are often deficient in vitamin K because vitamin K doesn't cross the placenta well. So they are born with vitamin K deficiency and they can have varying levels of vitamin K deficiency depending on medications that the mother is taking during pregnancy 
or if they are breastfed too much early on without having a vitamin K supplement. So this is actually a common cause of vitamin K deficiency. So in neonates, in the neonatal period, another one is reduced dietary intake. So that makes sense. So if you're not eating enough leafy greens and some vegetables like Brussels sprouts and spinach, you may be deficient in vitamin K. Where we see more specifically is with patients on TPN or total parenteral nutrition, where that total parenteral nutrition does not have a vitamin K supplementation. So if patients are on TPN and they're not being supplemented with vitamin K, they can have a vitamin K deficiency. And we can also see vitamin K deficiency being caused by malabsorption processes. So things like inflammatory bowel disease, so Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can lead to a decreased absorption of fat soluble vitamins like vitamin K. And we can also see malabsorption being an issue after certain gastrointestinal surgeries if parts of the gastrointestinal system have been removed so that the patient is not able to absorb vitamin K efficiently. We can also see vitamin K deficiency with medication use. So warfarin is a big one. Warfarin actually acts as a vitamin K antagonist. So it really leads to a functional vitamin K deficiency. So there might be enough vitamin K, but it's not being able to be used properly. With regards to broad spectrum antibiotics, the reason broad spectrum antibiotics can cause vitamin K deficiency is that it can kill some of those gut flora. And those gut flora, as we talked about before, can actually make endogenous vitamin K for us. So if we wipe out some of those gut flora, we may be left with less bacterial species that are able to produce vitamin K, so we'll have less vitamin K around. And another cause of vitamin K deficiency is genetic cause. So this is very rare. It's called hereditary combined vitamin K dependent clotting factors deficiency, VKCFD. So again, this condition is very rare, but it's good to know that there's actually a genetic cause of vitamin K deficiency. So what are some of the clinical features of vitamin K deficiency? Coagulation issues is one of the most overt clinical features. So we talked about some of those processes whereby we need vitamin K. So where vitamin K acts as a cofactor for enzymes that add gamma carboxyglutamic acid to factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. So if you're not going to have the proper modification on factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, they're not going to be able to properly work. So you're going to have issues with coagulation. So you're going to have issues with bleeding. So there's an increased risk of bleeding. So we see increased bleeding with minor trauma and cuts can have increased risk of certain types of dangerous hemorrhages as well. And we can also see issues with petechia, purpura, and ecchymosis when we check their skin. Now there's also what we call vitamin K deficiency bleeding or VKDB. So we see this in neonates where they have umbilical bleeding, GI bleeding or bruising, and they can also have issues with intrathoracic, intracranial, intra-abdominal bleeding. So those types of bleeding. So it can be very severe and very deadly. And there's actually a few different time frames as to when neonates can get this. So early vitamin K deficiency bleeding occurs within 24 hours of birth. So it's more associated with anticonvulsant use during pregnancy. So I talked about if the mom is using certain medications during pregnancy, they're more likely to have issues with vitamin K deficiency. So anticonvulsants is one of those. Classic vitamin K deficiency bleeding occurs within one week of birth and late VKDB occurs within one to 12 weeks of birth. So although I talk about increased risk of bleeding, it's important to note that most adults with vitamin K deficiency do not have clinically significant bleeding. And the exceptions to this are when the vitamin K deficiency is caused by medications like warfarin or certain malabsorptive conditions like inflammatory bowel disease. So again, most adults with vitamin K deficiency don't have a clinically significant bleeding except where the vitamin K deficiency is caused by medications or malabsorptive conditions. So some other clinical features of vitamin K deficiency involve bone development. So we talked about where vitamin K leads to the carboxylation of osteocalcin. And osteocalcin has a role in bone mineralization. So with vitamin K deficiency, we see decreased bone mineralization. Because of this decreased bone mineralization, we see osteoporosis. So where we see normal bone, it becomes very parotic. And because it becomes parotic, it becomes weak, and it has an increased risk of fractures. And these are often chronic findings. So it's not often in the acute stage, but more if a patient has chronic issues with vitamin K deficiency. So how do we diagnose and how do we treat vitamin K deficiency? So the diagnosis of vitamin K deficiency can be determined by laboratory investigation. So a lot of times prolonged 
prothrombin time, or PT, is often one of the first findings of vitamin K deficiency. So we can see a prolonged PT and a normal PTT. And then eventually, if vitamin K deficiency lasts for a very long time, we can see PTT also being prolonged as well. So the first one is usually an increased prothrombin time. And then we can look at levels of something called protein-induced by vitamin K absence or antagonism. This is called PIVCA2. And we actually see that this is increased. So with individuals who are not getting enough vitamin K in their diet, this protein actually increases in levels. So we can actually measure this and detect it to actually see if there's an issue with vitamin K deficiency. And you might be asking, why don't we measure vitamin K? Well, the fact is, is that when you measure vitamin K, it oftentimes is quite variable. So it can vary quite drastically with specific diets. So something that a patient might eat recently could affect the level of measurement. So a lot of times we use these other measuring tools, prolonged prothrombin time and the PIVCA2. So how is vitamin K deficiency treated? So in neonates, clinicians will use prophylactic IM administration of vitamin K because we know that neonates are going to be born with some level of vitamin K deficiency. Prophylactic vitamin K is often given. For replacement of vitamin K in general, in adults, clinicians will often give oral or subcutaneous replacement of vitamin K. And in the case where there's severe bleeding due to vitamin K deficiency, fresh frozen plasma or FFP will be transfused to help with the bleeding. And some cases, if there's a case of VKDB in a neonate, there can be a slow IV infusion of vitamin K to help with the treatment as well. So Again, vitamin K deficiency is diagnosed using laboratory investigations like a prolonged prothrombin time and increased levels of PIVCA2. With regards to treatment in neonates, clinicians use prophylactic IM administration of vitamin K. In adults, oral and subcutaneous replacement of vitamin K is used with regards to severe bleeding. FFP transfusions are used and in the cases of VKDB, slow IV infusion of vitamin K is used. So if you want to learn more about other vitamin deficiencies, I have several lessons on other vitamin deficiencies. So please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.